Hi, everyone. I am so, so happy to be here. Uh, this is really, um, really amazing, like exciting for me because this is the first Backstage Con. Uh, this is, for me, like the way I see this, this is the beginning of the DX era. From, from he, this is the first time probably, like even five years ago, we didn't see this kind of enthusiasm for improving developer experience. And uh, what we're seeing now is, uh, and part of the reason why we're all here is because our employers are investing in making developer experience a priority. Um, and uh, be, and they, they are doing this because they're seeing value um, in what developer experience, uh, the impact the developer experience has on organizations. And it should be of no surprise to anyone that uh, Spotify, the engineering organization that brought us the Squad framework, should play such a significant role in this um, in this transformation, because fundamentally important technologies they're made by communities, and a community has a shared culture. The culture that, that Spotify cultivated within their engineering organization is what produced uh, Backstage. And what's really exciting for me is that now, um, by open sourcing Backstage and by making the framework available to, um, to, for us to use, um, and more importantly, creating a community around Backstage, what we now get to do is create real magic. And uh, what I'd like to do is I want to show everyone a demo. And for those who are coming in late, are going to miss out on some of the demo. Um, so. Um, but, uh, so, I, I'll, um, I will <laughs> introduce myself. <laughs> I am, uh, so my, I'm Taras Minkowski. I'm the CEO of Frontside. Um, we are a DX consulting company, um, and we were doing DX before, uh, b before DX was called DX. And um, w w Charles, who's the founder of the company, has a motto that we want to make developers feel like they're flying, and it's always been what we've been trying to do. And uh, the way we do that with Backstage is we offer enterprise support for teams that are adopting Backstage. Um, and we're, we're honored to be a, a professional Backstage service, a Backstage professional services partner. So demo time. All right. So um, this demo is something that, um, that everyone at Frontside contributed to. Everyone somehow had a role in putting together this, this, present, this demo for me to show you. So what I'm going to show you today is, um, is a, a new plugin. Um, this is kind of a proof of concept at the moment, but it is a fully functional plugin. Uh, we wanted to validate the architecture this is, and this is, show that this is possible. This is what we call a, a platform plugin, backstage platform plugin. What it is is it's a plugin that allows a developer at um, a developer who's using Backstage to download a CLI tool to their computer that allows them to use a Backstage instance. So it's a CLI tool that is created specifically for each Backstage instance. So you can install this plugin, and then what it will do is once you install the plugin, it will give, um, uh, give you this command. So you can then take this command into your terminal, and you can drop this in here. And what it's going to do is it's going to download the, um, it, it'll download the binary to your computer and put it into path. So now I can do which IDP, and then IDP, the IDP binary is in my path. So um, this binary is generated specifically for, for this particular backstage instance, and the operators, the developers who are building the backstage instance can control which, what, what commands it has. So what you see here is the help that is generated from the binary. So if I do IDP help, it will show us the same information. And so what, what you'll see here is that this binary, because it is generated from inside of your Backstage instance, it has access to the config configuration of your Backstage instance. So it actually has, it comes pre-compiled with the, uh, the URL of the Backstage API built right into the, into the binary. And what it shows you, you could see, is different commands that you can execute. So, um, so for example, you could do like um, IDP info, and what I'll do is I'll go and read the catalog, and it'll show you the catalog, uh, the, the current 
the in the current working directory, it will figure out which component you are looking at, which component is associated to the current working directory. It will go into the catalog and find out that information and show it to you and give it to you in a console. So that's, that's kind of cool, but um, what's even cooler is that you could do, let's see if I have it here, you can, you can run the scaffolder. So if let's say you're, you're inside a project, you could say, okay, what we're gonna do here right now is we're gonna create a new component and it's going to be called the uh, backstage con component, the backstage con demo. Backstage con demo, is that better? And then we're gonna run this. Demo, okay. So what it's doing right now is it's, it's actually using the scaffolder API that's running on your server and it's executing the scaffolder and it's writing the output into your terminal. So, um, Right now, it's, it's doing the exactly the same things that you would do in a browser, but it's doing it in CLI, uh, and it's reporting the feedback in a CLI. This is failing, but it's not supposed to be failing. Anyway, so, <laughs> so, <laughs> right. um, so now that we've cloned this component, what we can do is we can actually, uh, sorry, now that we, we've generated this component, we can clone it. And this is what's one thing that's really cool is that you can clone it without actually having to leave your terminal to figure out what the URL for this thing is. You could just do IDP clone, and it shows you the components in the, um, in the catalog that have a, um, have a repository annotation attached to it. So if you, have, if you have Bitbucket or if you have GitLab, if you have GitHub, according to whatever backend you're using, is going to look up those annotations and is going to report the, the things that you can clone. So here what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna clone my backstage uh, con demo. And so now what it's doing is it's, it's using the platform API that's provided by the plugin to figure out what the, uh, what the URL is where you can clone this and it, it picks up the URL and it just clones the, it clones the, um, clones, uh, clones the project for you. And so now we have in our working directory here, we have our backstage con demo. And we come in here, we can go, okay, let's do um, backstage, let's do IDP uh, info. And so now we're getting the catalog info for the current working directory, for the component of the current working directory. And here's where I think like this is, what we've done here is we've, we've set up kind of the shell of what we can do, but I think with the real meat of what we wanna be doing here is we want to be able to go into a component. So a developer working, so a developer who is your user has this, has this, has this can have this binary, on their, this executable on their computer, and they can go into any working directory where, uh, that is connected to a, like a deployed service, and then you can just go IDP logs, and what they'll see is logs that are being streamed directly from their service. So this is, these are the logs of the, of the service that is currently running um, on our platform. This is, the, this is the workflow that we're kind of, this is the workflow that we're after. Uh, thoughts? Who thinks this is cool? Because I've been working on this for like three weeks. All right, <laughs> okay. Okay, awesome. Okay, great, thank you very much. Whew, relief, all right, okay. So, um, all right, so now uh, the demo is finished, so let's talk about, um, let's talk about why, we, why would we actually wanna do this. So, uh, why is it not enough for us to just have backstage app? Because, because, because the backstage app is pretty awesome, and, um, and, but, but the reality is that our developers are not developing in backstage. They are not using backstage as a development environment, they're using backstage to get information. So when they are in their editor, they're doing code. When they're in backstage, they've context switched into backstage. And as amazing and like, I think backstage catalog is an incredibly important piece of software that, it, that every organization needs. But the reality is that developers are writing code in their editor. And if we can bring the information that we have from the catalog into their editor, we can empower them to focus on the work that they're doing without having to switch out into a different system to, to get the information that they need. 
So, um, and the other, uh, the other challenge with, uh, with, um, with Backstage currently is that it only supports some of the use cases. So like one of the use cases of the, of the catalog is that you, you can go find the components that you want, but that is going to, th that is really important and it's a really important piece of, of, of part of the work that we have to do. Um, but that's only one of the things, uh, you know, being able to template is also a really important use case, but it's only one of the things. Like the kind of things that it doesn't support, for example, is being able to get runtime information. So if you have a service that's running in the cloud and you want to get information about that service, what do you do? You have to go figure out what this thing is connected to, go into that platform, look at that information, and like you have to do a lot of jumping around. You can use uh, a Kubernetes plugin, which is great, it's very helpful, but there is a lot of other information that goes along to, um, that you need to know uh, beyond the Kubernetes runtime services that is not available just in Kubernetes. Um, our backstage app cannot manage secrets. So if you wanted to, if a developer wants to be able to uh, change secrets for their environments, what are they gonna do? They're gonna go to um, uh, AWS Secret Manager or they're gonna go to Azure Vault or they're gonna go HashiCorp Vault. Like they have to jump into a different system to do the work that they need to do. Um, if they wanna manage releases, man release, ma managing what, what they can deploy and what is available for them to deploy is not something you can do in Backstage today. And, uh, and you know, one of the things that is most tedious is having to go into Kibana and like type in just the right query to be able to get just the right log output to actually be able to see, you know, did your service start or not? Um, and that information, um, what ideally what would happen is that we have all this information in our Backstage app, um, but also it would be available in, in our uh, editor. Um, and what we really are after here is not replace the Backstage catalog UI or replace the backstage UI because both tools play their role in the actual process of making software, but you want to give developers the, the opportunity to choose. And the, the option to choose is really important because what you're doing is, um, and this is what backstage catalog has done really well already, is it's taken the, the infinite number of tools that, are, that, that make up the internal developer platform and it, it was able to, it, it provided us a place where we can condense all that information and stick it into a single page. So you can see, so instead of having to look, um, in, you know, going to the AWS and, and look at information specifically to, uh, or going to like kubectl and look for information specific to a service, you can get all that information displayed in one page. So you go into one page and it, give, it fans out and shows you information from all external services. That is really, really powerful. Um, but we can do more because, or there's an opportunity to introduce a new context because the editor context has additional benefits that we do not have if we're just using the browser. The editor allows us to say, this developer is working on this thing specifically right now. They are, the, the code that is open in their editor is the project that is open. So instead of it being like, you know, when you go to the, to, to the uh, catalog page, there are multiple, different kinds of people interact with that different, you know, the SREs, um, you know, product managers, different kinds of people get value from that different, from that page. But when a code, when code is open in the editor, you know it is a developer looking at that code and their work, they're, it's, it's, they're sitting down to do their work. So that added context is actually helpful because we could use it to distill information in such a way that is going to give the developers exactly what they need when they're working in the, in the editor. So that, so that they, could, they can choose whether they want to uh, go into a backstage app or, they, want, or they, they choose to stay in their, in their CLI, or if they find that they need to go to the platform and look at the dashboard that, that, that is somewhere outside of backstage, they can do that. Um, but the ability to choose the size of their context to be able to go from their terminal to backstage to, to, the, you know, to the tool outside of backstage is a way for developers to throttle their, um, uh, throttle the cog cognitive load associated with parsing all the extraneous information that they have to see when they're looking at, uh, when, when they're looking at any given system. Because it, it, every time you go further away from the editor, there is more information the developer sees that is unrelated to what they need to do. Sometimes that's, imp that, sometimes that's very useful because, you know, if, you're don't, if you don't know what you're looking for, you gotta be looking places where you're gonna see information that is, that is going to help you find something you don't know you need. 
but when you are looking for something very specific, the best case scenario is you just get that thing and you move on. And that's what, um, that's, that, that's a problem that's kind of, it, it's, it's a really big problem specifically on internal developer platforms. Because internal developer platforms are, they are a combination of all the tools that developers use to run their software. So, and there's a lot of tools. And in some cases, there are multiple tools within a single, uh, like in a single internal developer platform, there might be multiple tools doing the same job. So like, it's not unusual to have AWS uh, and Azure, or um, that's usually the combination. Google Cloud, people tend to use Google Cloud. <laughs> but but uh, for, but you know, it's, it's quite common to have, uh, or maybe AWS and Google Cloud. Like, that's, that's something that happens. Like, the same thing happens with, um, you know, for, like, at each, each aspect of the, uh, of the platform, there is lots, lots of things that developers have to interact with. You know, in orchestration, there's Kubernetes, Crossplane, Observability, there's all of these different aspects of their developer workflow. And all of these tools have um, all of these tools have a role to play, but it's a lot of information to parse. And so, um, what Backstage allows us to do on an internal developer platform is to um, is to really focus the what developers see in Backstage on the things that they need to see to do their work. And from all the different things that are available that you could integrate into Backstage. The things that are probably, like the, the thing that we see people asking for and the thing that developers need to know about it are, are things like, what are our runtime environments? Where is my service running? We see this in every, every customer that, that has Backstage deployed. They, they want to show that information because the developers want, need to know that information. How do I edit my secrets? And this is particularly you know, challenging in environments where you have an internal developer platform that's in flux or, in, or it's moving. because. The, um, because you might start off with doing a, a secret manager today, and you might use um, HashiCorp Vault tomorrow, but now you have developers who had to learn two different tools just to put their secrets. Like, most developers just want to put their secrets and move on with their life. And so if we can make secrets available in Backstage, we can eliminate the, the, the need for them to have to learn those tools to, to do their work, but also, if they want to, they can still have the option to. Like, we can still link to the original source of data, and if they need to access that information, they can still go there, but they don't have to. Um, and uh, of course, there's you know, the, the ability, there, there are lots of tools involved in the process of releasing software. So if we, instead of having to jump into, um, instead of having to jump into something like uh, FluxDB, what they could do is they could see, okay, here are the th things that are available. Or you're having to look into the container registry. Like they could just look in their backstage UI and say, here are the things that I can release. C can I press a button to release it? That's the kind of workflow that developers are after. And of course, the same you know, goes for logs because Kibana is fantastic, but what you really, most of the time what you really want is you want to see, like, can, I see can I see the thing that's, that I need to, to see to understand if my service is running properly or di did it start or did it not start? Um, and being able to see that within, within Backstage really focuses developer on seeing the, the information they need to see within the context of what they're trying to, uh, trying to accomplish at the moment. And so th this is what um, I think this, so like what, what I have here, just kind of concepts to get folks thinking about, like what, you know, what would it look like to have, the, um, to, to have these features integrated into Backstage. Um, so what, uh, what we're looking at here is, the, is a, uh, essentially a card that shows the d different environments that are deployed. There, there's a couple of interesting features that you might, you know, your developers would probably want. Whether your platform supports it or not is a different question, but the kind of things that you might want to be able to do is you might want to be able to clone an environment. So if you want to be able to make like an ephemeral environment, so it's nice to be able to say like, here's my development environment, let me just clone this thing, and then be able to, uh, be able to, uh, you know, associated with the, with the branch, and now anything that's pushed into that branch gets deployed automatically to, the, uh, to this environment. Uh, of course, being able to edit secrets for a specific environment, that's really helpful too, because sometimes you want to be able to experiment, and to be able to experiment, you need to be able to configure your system to use a specific token, for example. And, um, and being able to focus your, um, focus your uh, allow your developers to edit environment-specific secrets could be really helpful. Um, the same goes for, for logs. Um, time check, how am I doing for time? Five, five minutes? Woo, okay. All right, thank you very much. Okay, we're gonna go through this quicker. 
All right. <laughs> so, all right. Um, we're going to be able, so of course, the same thing with secrets, you know, being able to see secrets uh, in backstage and be able to edit them. Uh, what I really want to get to is I want to get to how do we do this? Because this is a lot of things that are, that we can kind of iterate on as a community, but, um, but the really, the really juicy part is in like, you know, how, do, how does the, how does the, what the demo that I showed actually works? So, um, so these are some of the UIs. That I, I'll share the slides so folks can check out this, uh, and we can talk about these things in the future as well. It's a really ripe topic for conversation. Um, so these are uh, these are what you know logs might look like in backstage as well. So here's the, what this is the part I wanted to get to is the the this this is what this this is what cloud native has been after for a long time. Like Heroku has been an inspiration for people for, for the last 15 years. And part of this is because Heroku provided a lot of functionality that was really valuable um, and has essentially become part of every internal developer platform. Like every internal developer platform can now, um, al basically allows developers to uh, provision databases when they need them. Um, you can push a repository, uh, you can push a commit that is going to get deployed to, to uh, VSCI or that's going to get built via, via CI. Um, you, can, you can deploy a container uh, using something like FluxDB. Um, you, you have a, automatic rollback built into Kubernetes. Um, you have auto scaling built into Kubernetes. The, what we don't have is we don't have clean UIs. So this is one of the things that people really loved about Heroku is that you have, the, you have a clean UI that gives you all the things in one screen, but it also you could do all the same things from the CLI. And that's really what, that's really, this, this is what, we're, we've, what I believe is the missing piece um, in this, our cloud native ecosystem that this community can, can really fill in the gap with, in. And so what, is it, what does it actually look like uh, at the implementation level? So what we'd have is, um, so uh, we have, have front-end components that are consistent. So every, regardless of what backend you're using, on the front-end, there's a set, same set of components for, for editing secrets. Um, you have a, a CLI that you can download from your platform, and then that, that CLI is, um, yeah, so, this is, so these, these are the components. You have, you have a CLI that you can, um, you can download, and the CLI runs on every, uh, on every platform. So like with the, the binary, the, um, what you saw that I downloaded, it adjusts, the, the installation script downloads appropriate binary for each platform. So we're using Dino, which, uh, which allows you to, to write in TypeScript, but Dino will actually create a binary that, that, is, that has no dependencies that a developer can download directly from platform API. Um, and, um, and so then what, what happens is, there, so these binaries are provided by this platform plugin that is responsible, that provides a platform API that gives all the data that, that the binary needs to run and it, it powers the front-end components as well. Um, and um, the binaries I, I mentioned are written in TypeScript, and um, here's, here's some, of the, some of the juicy bits, because each, each internal development platform is different. How you integrate your internal development platform into your backstage instance has to be different. So there's going to be resolvers that you can specify, which are basically functions that are going to, that, that are going to um, return data that matches the API that the front end and the CLI expects. Um, and those resolvers are backed by adapters, so you don't have to, the idea is that you wouldn't have to uh, re-implement everything from scratch. So we can reuse, so if someone implemented uh, AWS Secret Manager um, API for, uh, for, the, for these plugins, you can just install that uh, it's installed that adapter and it gives you that functionality. We want to be able to, as much as possible, reuse the work that we've done. So the, the design of this should allow us to uh, allow for that reuse. Um, and um, that is me. Um, I hope you liked my presentation and uh, thank you everyone. Questions? Thank you, Taras. Maybe we have a couple of minutes for questions. Yeah, when can you get this? <laughs> you can get it tomorrow. <laughs> uh, but uh, sorry, but for everyone else, um, so it's so it is software that is like we, we have it in our like our repo, our backstage instance is open source, so it's all there. Uh, but it's it's I mean, it's a good example of how this could work. It is works. I showed you in the demo, but there's still a lot of work to actually make this like robust, as you Damon know. <laughs>
Um, any other questions? Local workstations, uh, that's, that's one side, uh, but what about virtual workstations? Uh, have you considered like uh, Gitpod or uh, code spaces, like uh, this types of, uh, of uh, development environments? Um, yeah, I mean, it's, that's an important piece of the ecosystem, but I think, what's, in mo I think in both of those systems, you can, in, you can run, you would be able to run the binary in those environments, right, because they're basically Linux environments. So, there, there are lots of use cases. I can even think, I, I can even see like this kind of binary being useful for running uh, in CI. So, for example, like, right now we have to to configure tech docs. We have to uh, we have to con give tech docs access to S3 bucket or some kind of a storage container. So instead of using instead of giving it instead of accessing the bit bucket through the storage container, we could you could um, upload the documentation using the CLI directly through Backstage authentication system. So that would, that would reduce some of the friction, I think, in setting, setting up um, a tech docs. So there's, I could see a whole bunch of the environments where that, that could work. Any, any other questions? No? Okay. Great. Give it up for Thomas. <laughs>